Hello guys! In this episode you meet with a beautiful soul and amazing realist artist Michael Hloshek Nagel. Inspired by nature, classical music, Roman civilization, Egyptian art and archaeology, the artist depicts personal space of solitude, quietness, introversion and hope in his oil paintings. His canvases are female portraits set against dark, mysterious landscapes. Moody, solitary figures are caught up in self-reflection, yet embody strength and intelligence. Beautiful and often sensual women live in a quiet, dark space that's not self-explanatory. It makes us wonder about women's origin and thoughts. Michael's realist paintings exhibit masterful color harmony and visual balance. The artist lives with his wife and two children in England. We chatted late in the evening in the beginning of November 2021 with a four-hour time difference between Florida and England. The connection was really bad and parts of the recording uh, got lost in space for good. However, salvaged parts of the interview were stimulating. Michael is a very kind human being who opens his heart up, talking not only about the technique of oil painting, but also his worldview and how his creativity works to produce art. It's such a pleasure to have him on my show, and I hope you enjoy the recording very much. Hooked on Art podcast is available on Spotify, Apple, and uh, YouTube. Hooked on Art podcast is one of the top 10 art collecting podcasts on the web, rated by Feedspot. So, do you live in London or offline? Like no, we we lived in London for a decade. Uh, we've recently moved back to my uh, childhood hometown. Oh. Um, I have quite an elderly mother, so we've moved here to help with family things. Oh, it's also a nicer a nicer place to be raising our kids than London. London has issues. You mean that's too big for? too big it's too busy everyone there is crazy um, <laughs> sounds like moscow to me <laughs> yeah okay yeah no i i don't like the pace in london i see London so, is too far. so you like the countryside i do yeah <laughs> when i was a child all my friends were um meeting at pubs going to clubs drinking underage and i was wandering around fields and forests and i was very very happy yeah, I, I, oh. I can understand that. Yeah. yeah. I'm honored to have you on my show, Michael. Oh, please. <laughs> no, seriously. Uh, I'm, <laughs> I'm very happy that you agreed to do this. So. It's, it's it's a <laughs> so let's talk about the process of painting first, and then we'll talk about the stories behind your paintings. Okay. In one of your Instagram posts, I saw that you used the Zorn palette. Can you describe what it is, like for people who don't know what that is and um, okay. how you use it and how you modified it? Okay. Um, the Zorn palette is named after the um, Swedish artist Anders Zorn, and it's a limited palette. So it consists of uh, yellow ochre, uh, vermilion, most people substitute cadmium red nowadays, um, titanium white and ivory black. Now the beauty of it is that you can mix a very subdued but complete spectrum of colors from that. Mm -hmm. You can mix your whites and your blacks and you get grays and you put the grays next to warmer colors and they look quite blue. Mm -hmm. You can see an example behind me, actually. There is no color in the background in the landscape. It's just black and white, but next to the warm tones of the female figure, it takes on a bluish tint. Mm -hmm. Now, I cheat, and I think Zorn cheated, and most people who use a Zorn palette cheated. I will put a thin glaze of blues, mm -hmm. a, a nice ultramarine or something, when I need to 
give that some punch or boost it a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, so you take your gray and you add a little bit of yellow ochre and you have a green. Uh, you take your red and your black and you have a brown and you, you can modulate these, <clears throat> make them warmer, cooler. You can do all sorts of things with it. But it's a wonderful way, especially in the first layers of a painting. Do you paint on a tinted surface uh, or white canvas? Yes. Like what's yeah, your... I, I, I usually give it a thin wash of uh, a raw umber. Okay. Um, quite thin. I used to make the mistake of working on quite a dark ground mm -hmm. because it suited my personality. <laughs> But it was, it was giving me problems throughout the entire process of the painting. I was really struggling to get the lights that I wanted mm -hmm. and the purity of colors that I wanted. So I've only mm -hmm. actually very recently learned to start working on a much paler ground than I used to. Mm -hmm. I, I find that like if you create black and white underpainting, it's just too dark. It's difficult to like whenever yeah. I layer more color over it, it, it mm -hmm. just, uh, I think it, you lose luminosity or something. Yes, about yeah, absolutely. I, I was introduced to the uh, the technique of using a, a gris eye, a, a black and white mm -hmm. underpainting mm -hmm. at um, New York Academy of Art. And the tutor demonstrated it and I was very, very excited. Couldn't wait to do it. Mm -hmm. I spent days working on what I thought was a beautiful black and white underpainting. And I was just gonna glaze or scumble semi-opaque colors on top. And the tutor came and he looked for two seconds and he said, it's too dark. You can't do anything with that, bin it. Mm -hmm. And that was quite disheartening, but it was a good lesson. You really need, if you're gonna work in a, in a, a grease site, a black and white mm -hmm. underpainting, you really need to pitch it much lighter than you want the actual painting to be in terms of values. And that's a difficult thing to judge for me anyway. Mm -hmm. So that's not the way I work anymore. It's the old master's technique. And so yeah. I, I wonder why so many artists use that um, because it, it darkens the skin tones. It's difficult to bring the light back in. I mean, it's a lot easier to paint in brown tones uh, to give yeah. it the, the warmth and then layer color over it. But I, I, for many years, was a living example of the fact that you can do it in brown tones and still make it much too dark to too get dark. the luminosity <laughs> and the chroma that you want from your colors. So you basically uh, make a very light wash to start yep. and then you uh, begin painting in color. Is that? I, trans I transfer my drawing onto that. And then what I tend to do now is block in the darks and the lines that I need just with a very thin block in wash of typically mm -hmm. just raw umber mm -hmm. um, and then hopefully the base color that I'm working on is just about where I want the midtones of the painting mm -hmm. so then I'm adding lights and darks on top of that it used to be I got it so badly dark to start with I was just building up light and light and light and light mm -hmm. and never getting where I wanted to go um, it's not something that I feel completely in control of or like I've learned how to do it or I've mastered it. There's, there's nothing about painting I feel like I've mastered. It's, it's oh, just... I, I think you're excellent. I think you're very well, good. Well, that, that's very kind and that's very nice to hear. But I feel like every painting I make is an attempt to rectify the errors I made in the previous painting I made. And I think maybe that's what keeps me going. You know, it's exactly the same for me. I think yeah. it's like... It's exciting to start a new painting and I keep working on mm -hmm. it. But by the time I'm done, I'm like so done. <laughs> and I feel like <laughs> I, I failed and I need to start a new one. Yeah. I'm sick of the sight of them by the time I've finished. Yeah. There's, a, there's a sweet spot about two thirds of the way through every painting when I think, yeah, this is great. <laughs> and by the time I finished, I thought that was great and I've lost it. I need to start a new one. Whether that's real or in my head, I don't know. Yeah. It keeps me going. I think part of it is is in your head. I mean, it's... Yeah, doubt, undoubtedly, yeah. Sometimes I take my older paintings out, look at them, and I see that, well, yeah, they could be improved, but they look okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, I've, I've, got, I've got paintings that I, I remember just being so angry about how they had turned out, and now 
I look at them 15 years later and it's like, oh, yeah, it's, I can live with it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, how do you develop your sketch? Is it a sketch? Is that like a complete drawing that you transfer? How do you transfer uh, the image? Well, not the same way I was taught to and not the same way I used to. Okay, well. Uh, I used to draw from life. Mm-hmm. I used to sometimes use a grid to transpose it to a larger size onto the mm-hmm. canvas. And that's incredibly time consuming. Mm-hmm. And if you have a limited studio space, which I do, it's not always practical. Mm-hmm. Um, I even used to do a technique called pouncing, which is where you make pinpricks mm-hmm. through your drawing and then force graphite powder through. You know, I, I didn't think- like that. I, I tried ah. using this and I didn't like that ah. at all. Yeah, if I, if I was a, a, a 15th century master with five <laughs> studio apprentices, I would get them to do that. But yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm not doing that again. No. <laughs> so now, now what I tend to do is I, I um, the way a painting starts for me is, I don't know how a painting is supposed to start, but the way it starts for me is very often I just get the model and I set up the lighting. And usually in the process of setting up the lighting and the model, I'll see something that just connects or clicks. And I think, ah, oh, that, that's nice, that's nice, that's good. So I'll continue working with that. And I won't have any definite ideas of what I want the painting to be at that stage. It's a very big thing in my head, but there's, there's an atmosphere about the pose or the lighting that I like and I want to capture. Mm-hmm. Then maybe I go away and I read something and some element in some story or, or some, some work of uh, fiction or philosophy or history will strike a little chord in my head. And I'll think that photo in there, that I can use to illustrate this and, and things come together from different angles. So I'm not, uh, not someone who has a painting planned when I start it. Mm-hmm. Um, I just gather material that is visual that is literary. Sometimes it's even something as abstract as listening to a piece of music mm-hmm. will suggest a painting. Sometimes when I'm washing a canvas with raw umber wash, just as a, a, a background to work on, I will start to see a landscape in it <laughs> and I'll start to see where a figure could go. So I don't, I don't know how they, there, there's no, I maybe shouldn't be telling you this, but there's, there's no method that's no, it's I'm very sure. interesting to know how you end up with your paintings, like with the imagery, because I thought you would uh, set up a model, take pictures, or maybe a paint from life for some time, and then continue working from a picture. It seems like it's a little bit different <laughs> from what... It I is thought. a bit different. When, when, I, when I use a model and I'm taking photographs, mm-hmm. I don't have a painting in mind at all. It's just... I see that as one element of gathering material, but no more important than reading something or listening to something or mm-hmm. thinking about a particular subject. It's just another piece of material. I and see. Lots of times nothing comes of, of hundreds of photos that I take, but thankfully enough of them meld with something else in my head to make a painting idea. So let's say when you have an idea, you just uh, go back to your uh, computer and flip through your images. Yeah. Is that how? Mm-hmm. Mm. Yes. And so how do you design uh, the landscape behind the figure or how do you <laughs> add other elements? Is it well, this, <laughs> late in the process or you that is, that is That is late in the process very often. Oh. Um, sometimes I've had a vague idea from the start uh-huh. and I just need to firm it up and find something concrete mm-hmm. as I work. But sometimes it's as simple as I've done this or that with the figure and I think that background isn't working and I will get rid of it completely, paint it all off, remove it, scrub it off and, mm-hmm. and go through my source material and find something else that works. It's a question of finding something that works um aesthetically but that also connects with the atmosphere that i wanted in my head this i mean the the piece i was mentioning behind me here Mm -hmm. 
was a photograph of my wife and she looked extremely cruel. She looked uh, mean, unpleasant, <laughs> like she didn't want to be in the photo. And I thought, well, I can't use that. And then I was reading uh, something again from my, my favorite book, Metamorphoses by Ovid. Mm -hmm. And I was reading about the, the goddess Diana or Artemis being surprised while bathing by the hunter Actaeon, and she turns him into a stag, and her anger does not subside until she has seen him ripped to pieces by his own dogs. And it's a story I love, and then I thought, of course, my wife is that cruel goddess, Diana, and I can use this photo after all. So that's how these things happen. I wish I had some clever technique or plan or system, but it's... Yeah. it's yeah. I think uh, it's how creativity works. It's, yeah. It's a little bit of magic. <laughs> mm. <laughs> I don't know about that. Uh, I think so. I mean, yeah, I think so. We, we do plan things and we do um, develop the process, but the creative mm. part, it's always something, something very different. Yeah. It, you're you're only in control of it to a certain extent. Mm -hmm. A lot of the time when I'm working on a painting, I feel like I'm going down a hill on a skateboard as a as a twelve year old, and the hill is getting steeper than I thought it was going to get. <laughs> how much skin am I going to lose off my knees here? That's what painting feels like. So you mentioned that you use uh, you know this Zorn palette. Um, what like what if you need uh, a very bright color. Do you add, say? You, oh, you, yeah, you... listen. I'm. I'm I, I find the Zorn palette useful, but uh, only in the sense that when you're learning to cook, you don't throw in every ingredient in your kitchen when you're when you're making a meal. I, I in the early stages of a painting, I find it a very useful and quick way mm -hmm. of getting a basic color scheme down. And I almost always modify it. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I'm it. just thinking if there is some red in the painting or some yellow, you, you kind of mm -hmm. have to. Oh, you do. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. okay. Yeah, yeah. No, I make, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not a purist about anything in life. No. What's your favorite brand? So it's an Ectobert Rosemary & Co. And they are based up in Yorkshire in England. They keep their shape really well. They have a nice weight. They're solid. They're beautifully made. Um, and it's the first time in my life I have genuinely felt like my brush is just an extension of my hand and it does what I want it to and I'm not fighting against it. Mm -hmm. I know you can do a lot with your day, but you choose to watch and listen to this podcast and I appreciate it very much. If you find my podcast interesting and uh, fulfilling and helping you in your creative endeavors, please feel free to share it with your friends on social media or emailing the link to my podcast. I appreciate it very much. You know, I want to go back just a little bit. Um, I want to understand how you uh, transfer your images because you, you said what you did before, but like your process evolved. So how do you transfer your image now? I tend to work with the, the, the computer monitor, the, the laptop. Mm -hmm. That's what I work from. Sometimes I'm just copying by, by hand, by eye. Mm -hmm. um, if it's on a large scale and I have to be accurate and precise, say it's for a portrait commission, mm -hmm. um, I will project the image and, and do the basic lines with the projector. Mm -hmm. Do you find that the projectors distort the images or are you able to fix the distortion? If you have a, an image that is cropped to the same ratio as the canvas using, you, you can see that the lines okay. meet up with the edges of the canvas. Mm -hmm. um, you're just going to make sure it's at exactly the same height as the center of the canvas and exactly facing. Mm -hmm. 
you're minimizing the distortion by placing the projector right in the center of the canvas. Mm -hmm. Is that okay? I, I mean, I don't use yeah. the projector. I tried it, uh, but um, I felt like it didn't help me much. It made it more difficult, so I give up. I prefer, I, I prefer drawing by hand, but but sometimes it, it can save some time and, and mm -hmm. make sure the proportions mm -hmm. are accurate for a board. Mm -hmm. Uh, I did some mural work and it helped because you can enlarge the image big time and, you know, trace the image yeah. onto yeah. a wall. So what kind of uh, painting surfaces do you prefer? Is it a panel, a canvas? I, I've got friends who are trying to get me to, to switch to um, aluminium, mm -hmm. al aluminum, as you say there, yeah. composite. But the traditional, conservative-minded, old-fashioned painter in me says, no, canvas forever. Don't so, abandon canvas. So you like canvas. <laughs> I like canvas. Yeah, I like that texture. Wow, you even like the texture. <laughs> I do. I do. Wow. Well, why? until I can until I can afford linen, I'm going to work on canvas. Let's I put it see. That way. I yeah. see. I do see texture in your painting when I look at it closely, but it works beautifully. I don't know how you do it, but... Well, one thing that scares me, the, the idea of switching to a very smooth surface like um, the aluminium composite mm -hmm. panel would be, you can get so detailed on that. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I'd be able to stop myself. But the Individual are... skin pores <laughs> and eyelashes, and I don't want to go down that route but I might not be able to stop myself uh, I see I guess uh, we need to explain to anyone watching uh, that the more texture you have the less deta detail you're going to get <laughs> in your painting yeah but the smoother it gets the more detailed and realistic it it, it can get well I don't think those two are the same thing detailed and realistic often don't go together. Well, explain the difference then. Well, I think there's, there's many artists out there who, who paint every microscopic detail of the skin mm -hmm. and it ends up not looking like a living presence. It ends up looking like a painting of a photograph. Mm -hmm. um, because somewhere in all the detail, that human presence gets lost sometimes, not all, not all the time. Mm -hmm. but, so I don't think detail and realism are quite the same thing. I've, I've seen plenty of paintings killed by detail. Mm -hmm. Rough canvas. <laughs> Where do you think uh, there is a line between uh, realism and filling in the details? There isn't a line. There isn't a line. It's just you've got to know when to jump off that bus, you know, in the middle of every painting. It's like if I go any further with this detail here, then it's going to kill the image. I look back at paintings I did when I was 14 or 15, and they would be of females, and the amount of detail in the breasts. <laughs> <laughs> or the lips or the glossy hair and you could see where my attention had been mm -hmm. and I just think oh no you know I was focusing so much on details the details that I liked mm -hmm. I, I forgot to make them come to life oh. a lot of people who have seen my work only in, in reproduction think that it's almost photorealist but it definitely isn't it's, it's nothing like photorealism. Mm -hmm. You separate yourself from photorealists and because you, you do want to be different in this regard. I don't know if it's that or whether I just... I think sometimes you, you say a little bit more by, by, by not saying quite so much. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's the same way that people who talk and talk and talk very often don't have very much of interest to say. Mm -hmm who don't say too much, who often come out with something interesting. 
Yeah, I I mean, I do understand you very well. One of the problems that I have with photorealism is that it just looks too mechanical. And so Mm -hmm. I have to look uh, beyond copying of things and seeing if the artist sees uh, things in a very unique way. And then I Mm -hmm. can change my mind and think of photorealism in a different way. When I see just uh, an object being copied, it's not art, in my opinion, even if it's uh, beautifully done. But if it's arranged in a very unusual way, or there is something about lighting or color, then it could be very interesting. I mean, for me. Yeah, no, I, I agree. And it's, um, it's not easy to discuss because for me, you can't quite put your finger on what gives a painting a kind of a living presence rather than it just being a catalogue of details. Mm-hmm. It's, it's, intang- it's intangible what makes a painting live. Uh, and it's, it's not to do with the level of detail. Mm-hmm. So I can't really say any more about it than that. I can't describe it. But you know when you're in the presence of a picture that's alive and when when you're not. Who is your favorite uh, artist then? Whom do you admire? Living or dead? Ah, you can start from the dead. (laughs) So artists I love. um, Yeah, Goya. Mm -hmm. I love uh, Francisco Goya for his sense of the macabre and the grotesque and the evil. Okay. Um. In terms of technique, I love Zorn, Sargent, and uh, Velasquez. I'm probably pronouncing that wrong. Because, I I mean, they are prime examples of what we were talking about. Very little detail, absolutely alive. And it's the paint that's alive. And it makes the person in the painting alive. It's not Mm -hmm. the detail. Then there's painters I love for different reasons, like... Uh, Modigliani, Egon Schiele, who are unashamedly uh, celebrating the sensual and the erotic and the sexual. Uh, there's, there's a whole bunch of living artists working now, really, really admire and aspire to. Um, people like uh, Jordan Sokol, Mark Pugh, uh, they're all figurative, they're all realists, but it's a realism that is painterly and almost eerie and worldly. You know, I don't want to use the word spiritual because I don't know what that means and I don't think anybody really does. But there's something something happening on a very deep level in those works that I really admire. Okay, so why do you like Modigliani? I mean, I see other artists in your work, but Modigliani is so darn different. What do you like about him? Uh, what I like about Modigliani is all of the baggage that comes with Modigliani the kind of bohemian thing, the, the sexual element in the art. It's actually technically very fine work, but it's also very free. And that's, that's a place I would like to be one day. It's technically very good, but it's very free. It's very liberal. Um, and it's very sensual. And that's, that's something I've kind of avoided because in my own work, because I've kind of thought that if it's sensual, it's uh, maybe not so serious. And as a younger man, I was very keen to be serious. Um, I'm not so interested in seriousness anymore. It didn't get me anywhere. So, <laughs> uh, I, I thought of looking at, at people like Egon Schiele and Medigliani more and more, actually. Yeah. Oh, Bring back nudity. Yeah. I see. Why do you think that you are not free painting what you paint? Like, what do you want to do? Do you want to lose the extra detail or? Yeah. 
extra detail. I do. I, I, but again, it's not specifically about the detail. It's about, are you being a slave to something when you paint? Or is your mind truly expressing what it wants to express? And I find myself putting these constraints on myself when I paint. My work is far more neat and tidy than my mind is, let me put it that way. Hmm. Um, Do you think it comes from your education? You can't break away from your uh, accepted way of... Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Um, and also I think once... Once you do work in one particular style and um, a sufficient number of people say, oh, that's so nice. Oh, that's so realistic. Oh, that's great. It can be hard to say, yeah, but it's completely not what I really deep down want to do. Um, do no. you have a vision in your mind? Like, how do you know where you want to be? I don't. No, I don't. I, I just, I know that it's not quite where I am. That's okay. all that I can say. Okay, interesting. That might not be any more real than the dissatisfaction that I get at the end of every painting. It may be that everything's fine. I'm just... Uh... Yeah, that's what I'm thinking. <laughs> <laughs> this, is, this is not a therapy session, okay? I think you're just too hard on yourself. I know, <laughs> I, I know that... Um, I, I actually understand where you are coming from. I think when we are able to critique our work and like to push ourselves to do better, yeah. um, then art changes and it, it becomes better. But then there is a limit to that as well. I think yeah. like sometimes I become too critical of myself and everyone else. So I'm just kind of yeah. seeing that you kind of do the same thing. Yes. Yeah. Well, I, I have learned to accept it a lot more than I used to be able to. I, I used to look at every painting I did and I would get my whip out and I would be scourging myself over what I thought. And now I just think, well, this little voice, it's there. It probably always will be there. You've just got to smile and nod and say, thank you very much for your feedback and just carry on with your work and ignore it. <laughs> Where did you study? Where did you study art? Mm. You mentioned New York Academy. Well, first of all, I didn't study art. First of all, I studied um, theology and religious studies. Wow. Because uh, I was very religious. But that, that taught me a lot of things. And um, one of which was that I didn't really believe. In, in what do you was, mean? Uh, yeah, in any of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Or um, the institution. Um, no. Yeah. The reality of any of it. Okay. Um, I don't know, I drifted around for a while and a friend uh, who was a music critic who liked my drawings, he told me I should be doing art. And I said, no, I don't want to do art. I'm no good at art. And he phoned me up one day and said, um, you're going to art school, I've paid your fees. And I said, what? So that's how I began studying art. I that was at a, a school where I did a foundation year in Edinburgh in Scotland. Mm -hmm. okay. And that was a very wonderful year. Um, and from there I went to Glasgow School of Art, which recently burnt down, unfortunately, beautiful building. And there I got a scholarship to study at the New York Academy of Art. Okay. Um, which I did not complete because of my catastrophic private life, my personal life at the time. Uh, what could that be? Oh, uh, my, my, my then fiancé came with me and um, things that were bad went from bad to worse. And uh, she wanted to come home. So we came home. And then she said she wanted to break up. And I said, well, why did I come home? She said, I don't know. Oh, so that, that, was, that was an incomplete course of education in New York, but it was still a, a wonderful year that I was there. Um, so yeah, my, my art education has been 
less than complete. I don't know. Your art is amazing. No, <laughs> all art is amazing. No, yours is it's amazing. Any grown up makes art, isn't it? No. You gave up on religion. Like, were you like upset about the institution, the overall idea behind the religion, or you just decided that you didn't believe in anything and you needed to do something else? The fact that when I was a, when I was younger, mm -hmm. my religious beliefs, I never made religious art, but my religious beliefs and worldview um they kind of fed into my art in my head at least uh in quite a significant way and i think once i lost that belief um that was a bit of a struggle for me to find a subject matter and a purpose to art mm -hmm. um because i've been expressing this this thing this belief system this worldview in my work for many years and, and once I lost that I didn't quite know where, where my work could go or what its purpose was or indeed if it had a purpose. Do you mean that you lost your um, you lost meaning is that yeah, yeah. yeah. in my work mm -hmm. in my work this is something that I struggle with because sometimes I, I paint and everything seems fine, but then I always circle back to the meaning of what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. And this is really hard. This is like a big struggle. Yeah. 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 Well, that used to be the case for me. Um, And it, it's especially so because if you think that there is a meaning to the universe and to life and there is meaning and there is purpose, objectively speaking, mm -hmm. then you want to make art that meets up with that meaning, that expresses that meaning. But if you decide that you believe there actually isn't purpose or meaning to life or the universe, mm -hmm that's actually a very freeing liberating thought and you stop worrying about the purpose or meaning of your painting mm -hmm. and it becomes enough it really does become enough to say i love this process mm -hmm. this process makes me happy and sometimes the results make me maybe not happy but not unhappy mm -hmm. and other people like it and um it keeps me busy. It keeps me from drinking too much or uh, kicking dustbins in the street. Mm -hmm. It gives me something to do. Your work doesn't have to have a purpose if you don't think that ultimately there is a purpose. It can just be a thing that you do that you love. Mm -hmm. And that is enough. And when I, was, when, I, when I was a person of religious belief, I was scared that that wouldn't be enough. I didn't think that could be enough, but it is. And that's nice. It's good. Mm -hmm. I do it because I love it. So basically, it's enough for, uh, for you because um, you love the process of mm -hmm. painting. Yeah. Okay. And I believe that art is worthwhile. You know, the some of the earliest records we have of the activity of humans is humans making marks on cave walls mm -hmm. to communicate with each other or tell stories about themselves mm -hmm. or memorialize themselves. And I think art has a, a purpose for us as a community, as a species even. Mm -hmm. it's, it's cohesive and we, we need to communicate with each other. And it's one of the ways we do it. And that's enough. Mm -hmm. Very good to know. <laughs> <laughs> no, seriously, because this is something that I keep struggling with. Sometimes it works and other times I'm like, what the hell am I doing? Why don't I do something else? And like then, exactly. No, do. And then I, I'm like, we, I we're not do... all gonna, we're not all gonna cure cancer or or, or save babies mm -hmm. or design and, the perfect city. You and, know? and that's exactly the case. I don't know what else to do because I don't feel like I I'm interested in anything else. Yeah. And listen, most other humans 
rightly or wrongly, really value what we do. Mm. Not every artist, not every picture of every artist, but they really value art. It means something to people. Mm -hmm. And we can agonize over, over the precise reasons for that, whether rightly or wrongly, but humans love art. Mm -hmm. Not just as a commodity. Well, art is not a commodity, that's for sure. <laughs> well, yeah, no, that's true. There are some commodities pretending to be art, but that's a different story. Yeah. My favorite painting of yours is titled The Hi Hidden Language. Can you explain how you... Well, first of all, who is the model? I'm guessing it's your child. No, it's not. No, that was no. that was done, I think, before I had... No, maybe not before I had children, but I certainly didn't have a child of that age. Okay. Uh, the model, that painting is... It was a photograph of unknown origins that I found online, and I was struck by it but I've changed it enough that it is mostly from imagination. The basic pose I copied, I borrowed. Mm -hmm. The details of the face and the hair are mostly from imagination mm -hmm. um, and the butterfly. Uh, the meaning behind it was, I was hoping to communicate the sense that I had always felt that I didn't quite fit in with a lot of people in my life, but that when I was out in nature or with children or animals or just trees or fields, forests, I felt a deep, deep sense of connection. Mm -hmm. um, I felt that I was not in nature or visiting nature, but I was part of it, that it was one big, beautiful structure or story that I was a part of. And that when I was alone in nature, I felt a real sense of beauty and communication that I often don't feel when I'm with human beings. Mm -hmm. So okay. that, that was what I was attempting to communicate with that painting. Maybe not communicate that. In fact, I was probably trying not to communicate it, but that was what I was trying not to communicate. Okay. It was in there, but I was hoping it wouldn't be obvious. Most of your paintings are very dark. Like you have a figure, a female figure, and then there is a dark landscape behind her. Can you explain why, why you do dark paintings? Well, if I do a light figure in the light landscape, she kind of disappears, right? So wow. there's visual, visual contrast is, mm -hmm. is one element, but there is also the fact that uh, I don't think the default setting of, of our world is um, happiness and light and joy. I think there is tremendous sadness and melancholy in life we all go through things that are very difficult. We all have pain that we carry, we carry inside us. And I think my work is often an attempt to show a figure existing in a world that can be very dark and very bleak and very unforgiving, but finding a way to be light and to be radiant within that, trying to find peace in themselves and uh, a kind of a, a serenity inside mm -hmm. in a world that is sometimes quite hostile. Mm -hmm. Well, so, the all of your portraits, the figures, they look very uh, calm and um, confident um, almost. Right. Uh, and yeah, peaceful. I think that that's because they are, uh, I'm trying to show moments of 
acceptance and people who are not scared of themselves or of the world they're in, but people who have an inner strength and an inner serenity, whatever is happening outside of themselves. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't think about it too much, but obviously that's something I must have some psychological need to communicate. I'm probably just consoling myself um, because my worldview is not always terribly optimistic. And I think I am, I'm trying to find a piece in these paintings that maybe I don't really feel when I look around the world or look inside myself even. Mm-hmm. So I, I think I'm giving myself some consolation in these paintings or something to psychologically aspire to. Mm-hmm. They're not pictures of me. These people are probably doing better than me, the people in my paintings. They have a serenity that I wish I had. How do you pick those people then? How do you choose the models? It's a strange thing. When I work with a model, I want them to do very little. Mm-hmm. I don't want them to be demonstrative or, or communicative. I want them to be quite reserved, quite neutral, um, and do as little as possible because then it's like the photographs I end up with are like a blank canvas. I can kind of put them where I want because mm-hmm. they're not being too joyful or too sad or too anything they're being slightly ambiguous mm-hmm. sometimes the photos of them being ambiguous like that happen by accident because they look very serious or very happy but there'll just be one or two shots where they're just neutral where they stop posing almost mm-hmm. so it's not a question of choosing models who have a serenity or anything it's a question of just finding a moment where the image just happens to capture something that looks like serenity. Mm -hmm. It may have been boredom. It may have been that they were sitting there thinking about what they were going to do tomorrow or how they were going to do their hair the next day. I don't know what's going on, but there's just a moment where they're in this neutral, ambivalent, serene state that is just what I want in my paintings. Mm -hmm. Why do you have females? Part of that is from my background. Um, When I grew up, I was surrounded by Catholic art and I was surrounded by images of the Virgin Mary, Mm -hmm. and Mary Magdalene, and uh, this or that female saint, usually suffering and gazing up to the heavens. So the iconography of the female has kind of surrounded me all through my childhood and young adulthood. And I find that hard to let go of. And I think there is something, there is a difference for me with with males. Uh, There is a, I often find when I've tried to photograph males, there is an overconfidence uh, that I find quite off-putting as a human being. They're very, they sit down and they're confident and they're purposeful. And I think instinctively, I can't work with this. Um, And I used to do a lot of child portraits Mm -hmm. when I was younger. And I did notice a distinct difference working with male children and female children. The male children were much more. (laughs) I, I, I find it really hard for me psychologically to work with. I'm nothing against men in, in, my, mm-hmm. in my everyday life, but visually, they, they visually men speak a language that I find a little bit troubling. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah, <laughs> so I'm guessing you like the softness of the female uh, model and uh, the mm-hmm. ability not to pretend or be too confident? That's another thing. I think there is less posturing Mm -hmm. with females. I think men, women are of course concerned about image, of course, Mm -hmm. but but men, 
masculinity doesn't come naturally to every man. And so there's, there's a lot of men who are faking a lot of the time. Mm -hmm. As a kid, I used to have real problems with other boys at school. They would, uh, they would get on my case about doing eccentric things like reading books or talking to girls. And they would make my life miserable for doing these strange things. Uh, so it, I had a, I, I developed quite a low opinion of, 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 of men at an early age. And there's not much that I've seen in the years since that has persuaded me I was wrong to have a slightly dim view of the male of the species. I see. Wow, that's interesting. And I alone was saved. That's another painting that I really like. It was about a looming sense of disaster that seemed to be gripping the world at that time for various political reasons. It was a strange time to be alive. There was also a sense that in the West, the party was over. Uh, the, the fun party times of the 80s and early 90s had gone. And we now lived in a much darker time. And the decline of the West was something we had better get used to living through. Um, and so that painting is basically a little abstract fairy tale about the coming end of the Western world we knew and loved when we were little. When did, uh, when did you paint that? Like, what year? Uh, Approximately. Like, I think it was about a decade ago. A decade ago. Okay. Uh, so can you explain what ideas and feelings you wish to communicate with your painting? I know you talked about it already, but maybe you can add something in particular that you want to say? If I had to simplify it, I would say that the purpose of, of most of my paintings is to say, if you feel um, alone or small or lost or troubled, by the way the world is as an individual, if you subjectively find getting through this curious human life a less than easy process, then you are not alone. Um, and I hope these images can remind you that you are not alone and remind you to be calm and optimistic and find peace in yourself. That's, that's all I'm doing. Okay. That's about it. Okay. That's... Does that sound horribly sentimental? That sounds awfully mm -hmm. sentimental, doesn't it? No, no. Any answer is a good answer in my opinion. <laughs> <laughs> because mm -hmm. you are, you are the, the creator. I mean, uh, no one knows your work the same way as you do. So um, I think you can give the best explanation. Well, yeah, I, I think they are, um, they're about the strange, solitary, subjective experience of being a human in, in, in a, uh, a dark and sometimes very impersonal world that we seem to have created for ourselves mm -hmm. so i hope other people who feel like that about life find some something in them that they recognize and like you said that your paintings are not expression of you why do you think that i think they are an expression of me but i think the people in the paintings are not an expression of me okay they are, if you like, little secular saints. Okay. They're icons of 
the person you could be or the person I might want to be or icons of some belief I have about what it is to be a human, but they are not necessarily me. Mm -hmm. So what do you think is you in your paintings? I mean, there's a little signature in the corner. <laughs> oh, uh, come on! <laughs> listen, I, I don't leave much of myself in my paintings, I don't think. I, I even cover up, I cover up all my brush marks. I'm like trying to hide my footprints as I go. <laughs> uh, <sighs> I'm, I'm quite a secretive, hidden, reclusive little person. Uh, if, if, if I were revealing myself in my paintings, I might not even tell you. I might pretend I wasn't in any case. All right, all right. So how does your family influence your art? Do they, <laughs> do they come in and say, oh, I don't like this, or I love that? Like, what's the... My daughter is my harshest critic. If she doesn't like a particular thing, she will let me know. She's usually very kind. She cannot be objective about paintings that feature herself. She hates them all with a passion. Oh my she, God, how old is she? She's, she's, <laughs> she's nine. She sees a painting with herself and she's like, ugh, ugh, go away. <laughs> so I think she's unfortunately going to be a little bit like me. Um, I see. <laughs> but having children, um, I don't want to say it's the reason I paint, but there was a time when I wasn't taking art terribly seriously because I didn't know what its purpose was, as we were saying. Mm -hmm. I didn't know if I was any good at it. And so I wasn't really trying. And I thought, what the hell kind of example is that to set your daughter or your son? Mm -hmm. You know, put all your stupid doubts to the back of your mind and try to set a good example. If you fail, if you try hard and fail, that's a better example than just not trying. So having children is the reason I, I'm trying so hard to improve my painting now. Mm -hmm. You know, I have just the one child, I have a son, and um, I think he changed me so much. And I didn't expect that to happen, mm -hmm. but... Uh, yeah. He challenged me in many ways, uh, that's for sure, because a lot of times it's very difficult. Uh, but, yeah. but I think he also sustained me and mm -hmm. uh, made me, uh, um, you know, keep going and um, yeah. doing what I do. So yeah, yeah, it's a surprise. You, I, I, I don't think of myself as a terribly nice person I don't have a lot of love from many people and and when we had our first child I could not believe how much love I felt mm -hmm. and I don't know where it came from I didn't know I had it in me mm -hmm. but from the time we saw the the scan the the ultrasound mm -hmm. and I saw this little heart beating in there it just changes everything changes everything mm -hmm. And I know people without kids will be saying, oh, shh, shut up. But no, it does. It changes everything. Mm -hmm. Whom did you want to be growing up, like when you were a child? Who or what? Well, you can answer it any way you like. Okay. When I was growing up, I wanted to be a man named Howard Carter. And who's he that? was the archaeologist who discovered the tomb of Tutankhamun. Oh. All my childhood, I wanted to be an archaeologist. I loved history. I loved ruins. I was always just digging random holes to see if I could find anything. Wow. Um, I still love history. I, I, I love reading about history and, and studying history. But yeah, I definitely wanted to be an archaeologist. Why did it change? I hit puberty, I discovered girls, and the only way I could deal with it was drawing them. So um, <laughs> that's very funny. <laughs> I started getting into art. But I still love history. I still love history. Yeah, it shows in your painting. Yeah. 
Mm-hmm. It's going to show more. I've realized. I've realized that's my subject now. Mm-hmm. It, it does show. So, what's your favorite place? It's either New York City mm-hmm. or the Bay of Naples. Okay. Or, or Rome or Death Valley. Death Valley. Why? Uh, I love the desert. I love the emptiness. I love the barrenness. I love the old ruined ranches scattered around Death Valley. I love the mountains. I love the heat there. I love the Charles Manson connection. I've always been a big true crime fan. Love Death Valley. Okay. I I was there once. Yeah. It was too hot. <laughs> it's too hot. That's, that's part of it. Yeah. But, But it's, it was beautiful. Uh, it's raw, extreme nature in its most unforgiving. It's like being on the moon, being in death. Mm-hmm. It's yeah. it's it's a different planet. I think that's why I love it. It's a different planet. Uh, well, no, I just want to say thank you for for uh, wanting to talk to me. It's 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 always a big surprise and a really worrying surprise for someone <laughs> as reclusive. <laughs> myself no it's 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 been a real pleasure and it, uh, it's it's something i always think is going to be horrific and then it turns out not to be horrific and i could chat for hours so well if you want to do it again just let me know <laughs> <laughs> i will i will uh, um thanks michael i i really appreciate you oh, thank you you know taking the time and explaining your art it, I think it's important for people to see artists in their studios doing their work. So, well, someone enjoyed it. Yeah, I certainly did. And thanks so much for watching and listening. Uh, take care. Bye bye.